Assalamu alaikum and peace. Uh, welcome to Muslim Network TV. Muslim Network TV is always their Galaxy 19 satellite uh, covering the whole USA, Canada, and Mexico with 57 million subscribers, uh, which are uh, uh, you know, mostly in rural areas where normal television is not available. We are also on Amazon TV, Fire, uh, uh, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, as well as Apple TV. You can download our app on your cell phones uh, or watch it on our website, muslimnetwork.tv. If you are uh, among those people who watch everything through YouTube, of course, you can find Muslim Network TV there. And do remember to subscribe if you do that. Today, we have two persons who are artists and they're doing an amazing job. Uh, they, you know, they're artists, but they are breaking many barriers. Each one of them has African heritage. Canadian and US heritage. They have, uh, uh, they are both Muslims, uh, both are performers, both have been all around, and uh, uh, both are women. So many things, uh, some competition with Kamala Harris, I guess. So welcome uh, to Muslim Network TV in this program, the Slim Jamila. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for having me. Wa alaikum salam. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. Uh, Taslim Jamila is CEO of My Soul Speak LLC. Why do you have to add LLC? It loses <laughs> all the power of My Soul Speaks. <laughs> 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 Okay. She hosted and produced the weekly art show for 10 years mm -hmm. at uh, Radio Islam in Chicago and WCV 1450 AM, which has been now rolled into Muslim Network TV, except that she has enrolled her program into that. that, that that's something we need to talk about. Yes. And we have with us uh, uh, Timaj Jarad. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thanks for having me. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. Uh, Timaj Jarad recently joined the Toronto Art Council and is working on Black Arts Funding Project. Uh, a diasporic Ethiopian Canadian multidisciplinary storyteller. Boy, these ladies back too much. <laughs> wow, how am I going to compete with all of that? <laughs> Do I have to compete? I'm an old man. <laughs> no, you don't have to compete. <laughs> All right. Tell me, um, how do you brand yourself as a Black Muslim artist? Um, that's a great question. How do I brand myself? Well, I think just being who I am. I mean, that's who I am. I am a Black uh, Muslim artist. I don't intentionally put, you know, Muslim on everything or black on everything. I'm just, I'm an, I'm an artist, I'm an educator, and I am a founder, again, of My Soul Speaks, which is a company that focuses on establishing and creating cultural and healing events, products, and edutainment for the world. And so I focus on really branding the product, the the events, and the topics of whatever I'm talking about as an artist or an educator. And so that's how I go about it. And I'm just, I am, you know, a Muslim and I am a Black woman, but I do focus on just branding, being an artist and an educator and a holistic healing um, coach. So, Timaj, uh, I thought, uh, you know, in America, people say uh, <clears throat> white north to Canada. So is there is there anything black over there? <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question? I, I cut out for a minute. No, no, no problem. I was saying that the, you know Canada is known as White North uh, in USA. So how come black artists are found there? Are they only there are black people or just black artists? There. Um, so Canada is um, you know 
I didn't actually know that, that, that it was branded as a, the white North, but uh, there is a, a community here, a very diverse community, particularly in Toronto, but also across Canada um, of um, diasporic African um, communities. We have Afro-Caribbeans, East Africans like myself, West Africans, um, just across the continent. And also there's a history of um, black folks in Canada, even, you know, predating what we know as kind of like that, that, wave of migration in the 80s. We have um, African Canadians who were here um, from, you know, before uh, before slavery and also um, folks that were enslaved in Canada. Canada has a history of slavery as, you know, sometimes Canada likes to kind of sweep that under the rug, but that that's there. And then also black folks um, that came through the Underground Railroad and and black loyalists. There's a, there's a rich history of black people in Canada. And in fact, the first black Muslims to ever um, set foot in Canada were, um, you know, the first Muslims rather were black Muslims. So I always like to share that because sometimes that, that history is erased. Um, so I myself am a, a second generation immigrant. I'm Ethiopian Harari. Harari is my ethnic, the ethnic group that I belong to within Ethiopia. And there are tons of, of black artists too um, within the Muslim community here in Toronto, but also um, just, you know, across Canada. So Something that I'm really passionate about in my work, uh, and again, I, similar to Taslim, I don't necessarily brand myself as a Black Muslim artist. I think sometimes that's just where, you know, you kind of get in where you fit in, and <laughs> um, that's sometimes what I am branded as by the by the public because of the work that I do in my community. I run a festival called Luminous Fest, which is a Black Muslim arts festival. And really, I create these opportunities for my community because um, they're opportunities that I don't see happening for us and I see a need for it. And so I just like to create the spaces that I want to see for myself and for my community. So that's sort of how I've um, developed my arts education uh, career. So you have a Black Muslim art festival? Yes, uh, it's called Luminous Fest. We're actually entering our fourth annual year and it's a multidisciplinary arts festival. So we have performances from artists across various mediums, music, spoken word, et cetera. We have um, vendors, so we support uh, black Muslim entrepreneurs and we also have workshops. Hmm. Well, the slim, here's a challenge for you. How okay. come America has so many black Muslims, but there is no black Muslim art festival? Um, well, you know, I think in America, we have so many <laughs> black Muslims um, that we have so many different festivals. I don't know. There may be one that's a black <laughs> festival, but I know I've been a part of so many different festivals that were organized by black Muslims in Chicago, in Detroit, um, in Philly in New York, so maybe it just didn't have the name, quote unquote. Yeah, the branding may not be that way, but there is a whole lot of that takes place. Yeah, yes. we have so much. And even when she talked about, like Canada, when she uh, talked about just black people in Canada, I thought about, I was um, telling you before, my husband's family, they, from Canada, they, they were part of the Underground Railroad. And you have so many people, his ancestors, who walked across the Detroit River. And you have so many people um, from Detroit that did that in Canada. So I just wanted to kind of add that when she was talking about the history of Black people in, in Canada. He has several generations um, there as far as family and so many people from Detroit have that connection through that. But as far as the Black Muslims, um, I think we have a lot of different festivals that are all over. I have been part of one in Philadelphia and like I said, in Detroit over the years. So they are out there. Well, that's very interesting. You brought that your husband is from uh, Canada, from those generations of people who went there. So it seems that now the uh, underground is uh, in reverse gear. I mean, he is back to U.S. Yes. <laughs> so, so both places. Uh, you know, share a little bit what you just shared. I didn't know that that uh, there were first Muslims in Canada or actually black Muslims. Uh, are those people who came, who were, uh, you know, in US, we know our history in US is that, uh, uh, you know, in 1730, 1740, the 
uh, Muslims, <laughs> I mean, people brought from Africa, uh, we estimate 30% of them are Muslims. So we have uh, grave sites and uh, Muslim names. We have Muslim scholars who have written their diaries. So, so we have the whole history, even photographs of people who came. So so was was slavery directly slave coming directly they were muslims or people who came through underground were muslims so both actually a similar estimate here is 25 to 30 um, percent of those that were enslaved in canada um, as well as those that came from the us uh, escaping slavery were muslim and um, i think that there's also a, a community here as well with that um, with that ancestry and that legacy, a lot of um, the community, the African American community, live in Nova Scotia, um, and so there is a, a a rich tradition that unfortunately we don't hear about or learn about in our, our history classes growing up and things like that. Um, but this country has had a long history of slavery, um, of enslaving Black people, and that is something that you know it end it it ended earlier than it, it did in the States. Um, but it is still a history that that we that we have here and that we have to, you know, be aware of and accountable to and understand, um, especially when we're talking about uh, the intersections of being black and Muslim, we can't forget that being Muslim in general is, is something that a African people, um, not only African people like me that emigrated, but also African Canadian people, Black Scotians um, have a legacy of, and that's our, our story to tell. And sometimes we're erased from the narrative of being Muslim in general, which I find very ironic given that, you know, we're the first Muslims here. So I always like to share that story because of that. Mm. Now, you know, considering both of you are visible Muslims, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, Taslim, this is a Canadian term, visible Muslim, meaning they, they have a scarf or something like okay. that. They use the word mm -hmm. visible minorities, uh, as we say, people of color normally. Yeah. I think it's Canadian talk to talk visible minorities or something like that. Are there some challenges uh, for uh, artists? I don't find any challenges personally with myself. Uh, over the years, I've been an artist really all of my adult life. So uh, from acting, I am a playwright, an actor. I doubt it very much. I think you started when you were not even an adult. Yes, I wasn't even an adult. And I was teaching jury making at what 18 to actually Muslims in Chicago in uh, Markham at a, at a masjid there. So I've always been an artist and um, I was Muslim. So it always blended very well and it merged together. And I think people just got used to seeing me um, like that. And even when I started on a poetry scene in Chicago, which is huge, even to this day, it really was my foundation into spoken word. But I started off doing fashion design and acting and directing even before poetry and spoken word. So those are my the first mediums. And I started doing fashion design with clothing. I used to do fashion shows in Chicago with really well-known designers as well. And I went to New York to do some fashion designing for some big record labels when I was 19. And then I continued to do a few movies in Chicago and direct and always acting and working in the schools, teaching theater and fashion design. And so when I started on the spoken word scene, it was, there were other Muslims there, but we, it wasn't like we had a separate scene from just other poets in Chicago. We kind of blended in and people just accepted you for who you are. And Chicago um, is a very welcoming artist community. So it was just easy to be myself. I have people who are my friends to today who aren't Muslim and they know that I'm Muslim and still to this day. And so it was always very welcoming. It wasn't something that um, stood out in a negative way. And it was just a, a way for me to blend in. And even over the years, just always being myself. And I talk about just all different topics or so diversity of topics. I talk about um, you know, uh, things from a perspective of outside of me, what's going on in society, and also who I am and within myself, which is, you know, Muslim. So there are always elements that you will hear in that when I'm writing some 
poetry from my personal perspective because that is a part of who I am. So, but it was never just something that stood out and it's never been a barrier for me. Thank you. This is Imam Malik Mujahid and I'm talking with Taslima Jamil and Timad Jarand and we will be right back after these messages. Assalamualaikum. My name is Adam. You remember me? I appeared in so many episodes that Sound Vision has put on the market, no matter what it is. Oh, no. Hey, what's happening? Hey, oh, sorry. Lockdown is what it is. Well, continuing here, in this lockdown, Sound Vision never stops thinking about you, the viewer. We'll have to get back into production again, online and in line. Everybody in their own space, e even me. Although I'm stuck with Lanisa. Salam! <laughs> Salam! Salam! <laughs> I, know, I know, you were shocked too. Well, l let me continue. Uh, this, is, um, this is what I was going to say. Salam! 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 Cut! 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 <sighs> Finally, I get my own screen time again. Thank God. And so we invested in new equipment to bring you even better production with new songs and new singers and animations. Well, here are a few clips. And Sound Vision has brought all this into your home, making Islamic values and teachings easy. And if you know me, Adam, a multi-talented actor, <laughs> well, sometimes I'm an actor and, and, and the reporter and the... Well, that's enough. Let's move on to the next section. Well, you can watch these new episodes on our new app at www.adamsworldapp.com. We have previews happening every day on Muslim Network TV. Sound Vision has been serving generations, moving and changing with the times. We are all faithfully connected. That is a huge blessing. Your donation helps keep these programs available now and into the future. We take this job of helping tomorrow's Muslims today seriously, and you should too. Today, we need your help. Children absorb and learn from everything they encounter. Make that wholesome, positive, grounded in our faith. Together, we can accomplish our goal of raising better Muslims, better neighbors, and better citizens. Please donate generously. It's an investment in our future. But to finish, let me tell you there are new scripts of my new mission. And it is something that I enjoy talking about. My new mission is space. Houston, we do not have a problem. <laughs> Salam, see you soon.
Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. And we're talking with two artists, Timar Jayad and Taslim Jamila. Uh, Taslim did not face any challenges uh, in Chicago art community. Uh, Timaj, what has been your experience in Canada in this regard? So in terms of um, being a visible Muslim, I initially didn't really experience any, any challenges because of the way that I, I entered the scene, I guess, as a spoken word artist. I started, the first few shows that I performed at were shows that I created. So I really started creating spaces um, early on in my career as a spoken word artist. I would do like campus coffee houses and then a few of my friends, um, none of them were Muslim, uh, but we got together, four of us, and we actually co-founded a poetry slam called the Kitchener Waterloo Poetry Slam and ended up performing at the Canadian Festival of Spoken Word. And uh, that the, the slam, it's been, I think, almost 12 years now and it's still running. All right. So, <clears throat> you know, Taslim about the talking about the um, the the role art plays in bringing about uh, any social change, mm -hmm. as uh, you know, because of the electoral change, uh, uh, we have somewhat uh, slowed down on the Black Lives Matter movement. But uh, do you think, uh, you know, what role artists are playing at this moment in the Black Lives Matter movement? Um, artists. Artists are always at the forefront and of what's going on in society, on the political arena. They've always been the soundtrack to the revolution, the spokespeople, not always in a way with out with the picket sign, which many artists are, but with our voices. And I like to quote um, the activist and singer Nina Simone, who said our art definitely should speak to the times that we're living in. And so I think it's an it's a really intricate time and it's a, a time to make your art relevant and to speak and use your voice, your medium, whatever your medium is as an artist, to speak to the times and it can be your political or your voice and your way of adding to what is going on into in society with politics. So artists have always been uh, a way to document that we're here, kind of like the, the news media. I look at it like a, a public enemy group where the, the people to broadcast the news through our art. So it's very important to be an artist in this time right now and to put out as much art because people listen to artists. I say even sometimes more than preachers or imams, they'll listen to artists. Um, just the way it is, the frequency that it is made for us to listen to it um, in that way. It's very, um, very, we're very important part right now. Slim, are you putting me down here? No, I'm not. I'm just <laughs> I thought about that what I was saying. No, but okay. No, but I, I get it. I get it. So Timaj, uh, what is the you know, are the Canadian uh, black artists uh, you know getting up their act uh, in face of a campaign against racism, which in America uh, thanks to George Floyd, uh, which uh, took in a higher gear. Well, I think in terms of you know the response from the Black community, of course, there's a lot of um, a lot of pain around that, and and there has been. This is nothing new, and I think that th that's been echoed from you know people that I know that have been doing the work in terms of anti-Black racism work. That you know this isn't something that is uh, for a time or for a moment, but it's been ongoing work, and so um, it's been really important to elevate and amplify the voices of Black artists. Um, in my role at the Toronto Arts Council, that's part of what um, I'll be doing is creating a funding program for Black artists to do that. We have seen a response. We have seen more programming um, uh, and Black artists have always been, been doing the work and, always, and so there's not really anything that's necessarily changed other than, you know, continuing to do the work. And I think that it's, the onus is really not on us to necessarily respond 
bond. It's really on the community, those who position themselves as allies and supporters to kind of to kind of step up and make space and, and see where they have power in their lives and be able to redistribute that power to, um, you know, amplify not just voices and experiences, but also actually give real uh, opportunities for people to to do that that work of, of healing in in their community but also being able to to like really just exist without without fear um, I think it's a long road it's not something that happens overnight but I am sort of seeing things things change slowly but surely within the Canadian landscape and thanks again to the black organizers um, first and foremost who have been on the front lines doing the the work of um, community organizing for many years in Toronto and across Canada so what is Toronto Arts Council is it some government body so the Toronto Arts Council is an arm's length funder um, for the municipal, so for the city of Toronto in terms of um, arts. So uh, we fund local artists within Toronto. Um, there are different programs. Some of them are discipline specific. Some of them are, you know, sp specific to a community like the program that hopefully I'll be running. Um, and essentially, it's really just a place where artists can get some funding to create work, to perform, to distribute their work, um, to build programming in their communities. Hmm. So do, what what type of art farms do they fund? So um, all different types of, of arts disciplines, music, dance, literary arts, um, just you name it, <laughs> it's, it's funded. Well, do they do, they do uh, theater, films, uh, those type of things? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, any media arts, visual, film, theater. Um, so there's different kind of funding streams for all of those different disciplines. Mm -hmm. You know, working at the uh, Slim, working at the um, Radio Islam, you interviewed Michelle Obama once, didn't you? Yes, that was an amazing experience that I am really blessed to put that down on my resume and my bio. It was a really Amazing time working at Radio Islam. I think about it. It was a long, I was young and you gave me the opportunity to blossom and to grow and to be confident. And it, it was amazing for me to look on the internet. This is before all the different social media outlets, being one of the first to do what you were doing on a daily basis and to look at people that I admired on all levels from artists to historians who I've wanted to meet and I got a chance to interview them. So to me, that was remarkable. And to be able to interview her in person, that was something that was life-changing. Even her energy before she was the first lady, that was right when Barack was um, you know, running for president, it was an amazing experience to say, I interviewed you know, Michelle Obama, the first lady and her actually being from Chicago, from the South side of Chicago, I can relate to her so much. And she's such a role model for, uh, for me. And so for so many other women around the world, and just to see them triumph and to reach the levels that they have and to know that she only chose a few people at that time, a few stations to interview her. We were at, it was another person from Radio Islam. We were there live at an event. And she said, I only want two stations to interview me. It was one of the bigger stations. And then she said, I want Radio Islam to interview me. And so to me, that meant a lot for her to choose us over all of the other people who were trying to get at her to interview her. So that was really a remarkable experience for me at such a, a young age in my career. Hmm. So is there any specific person uh, who you met, uh, which the uh, match, which you remember, which helps you uh, develop uh, more relationship or more confidence or learn from? Well, yeah, definitely. Um, there's been several people that I've had the honor of meeting just throughout my career. Um, some of them are, you know, big superstars, and some of them are just people that have been really influential um, because of who they are and the light that they provide in this world. Uh, Warsan Sherry is someone who I really admire, who I have met several times. I've actually shared the stage with her several times. And, um, you know, her and I have had some really beautiful conversations about what it means to be a poet, what it means to be an artist, and, you know, um, how to not like really lose your, lose your way in terms of the, the grind of, of getting your work recognized and noticed. And really just her 
reminders to me have always been about, you know, returning to simplicity and returning to um, understanding that, you know, you are an artist, but at the end of the day, this is not all you are. Right. So I think that those are really beautiful reminders that, um, you know, her and I are the same age. So um, but she was a lot further along in terms of visibility in her career. And so that was a good thing for me to hear prior to reaching any type of visibility. Um, I also got a chance to share the stage with Sonia Sanchez, which was really cool. Um, She's, you know, like one of the greats. So that was a beautiful experience of just like witnessing someone who's been doing this for so long. and, and the, the the poise and the beauty and the energy and the confidence that she held, um, I was like, you know what, that's, I, I hope that's me in like the next 40, 50 years. And that also gave me like an idea of longevity that I can do this for my whole life. And like, there's this kind of adage of, you know, a poet doesn't retire, they die, <laughs> which I always thought was funny because it's like, yeah, this is not just a vocation. It's not just a job. It, you know, at the end of the day, it's not all we are, but it is a really big part part of, um, you know, who we are. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a career, but it's it's a part of you. It's a part of um, what you bring into this world. So yeah, it's that, those are the two experiences and the two people that stick out. Let me ask uh, both of you, how Islam reflects or informs what you do in your art form? Wow. I mean, Islam is, as you know, it's a way of life. So it informs everything that I do. It is um, at the forefront of my my thinking, my being, my heart, my soul, my spirit, it is informs my work, the kind of topics that I address. It informs the way that I address them because in I look at it not from to say, okay, this is from a Muslim perspective, but that is who I am. And so at any moment, even as I'm growing and evolving and elevating, perspectives change, I grow, I learn more. And so my art is kind of just a journey that comes along with it. And and being a Muslim in in the world, it is very important because our voices, sometimes people haven't heard or they haven't even been around a Muslim. And so I'm oftentimes in certain spaces where I'm their first introduction to someone that they actually visually like who see or they know like to identify like, wow, she's a Muslim. So in a way, I'm always asking Allah to use me, you know, as a vessel, however he likes. And to know that people are always watching and I'm always a representative of Allah, whether I say anything or not, uh, of Islam as well. And just of um, Black people, of my parents, of where I come from. And so it has been really a a beautiful journey to be in spaces and to represent being a Muslim and being a woman and being Black and to know that people say, wow, I I didn't know that. I've I've never known any Muslims. Okay, you're the first Muslim I met. I didn't know Muslims, you know, did poetry or, wow, that was really powerful. Or you talked about this or just the same ways they can relate or learning something that they didn't know that was new. So it definitely is it's interweaved in, in my whole being and who I am. So it's no way to detach it from who I am. Wow. That was something. You can compose a spoken arts work based just on that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> MashaAllah. Uh, this is Imam Malik Mujahid. And we're talking with two beautiful artists, uh, Muslim, African, uh, American, Canadian, Taslim Jamila and Timaj Jarad. And we'll be right back after these messages.
my wife who uh, she's a professor at the University of Cincinnati who, who's Catholic and by her watching and listening to our three-year-old son uh, watch Adam's World she ended up taking Kalima Shahada she embraced Islam because she learned so much about Islam and the other prophets it really affected our life in a great way and because of uh, sound vision and Adam's world, we're Muslims. I took my Shahada 15 years ago and I actually am from a rural part of Ohio and so I found the catalog for sound vision and I ordered the the tapes and the CDs and the books and I use those and especially for my little daughter you know that's how we basically learned our Islam and Islam entered our hearts through the wonderful works of, of Sound Vision. Okay, alaikum, brother. I just want you to know that I love the Sound Vision website that a lot of times when I'm looking for information especially as it relates to homelessness domestic violence and women issues I go to that website and then I see what you've written and then I copy and paste it and spread the word because the wisdom is there so I can't you know, I can't do any better than what Sound Vision has already done. Sound Vision is our survival uh, uh, guide. It is the uh, organization that provides skills for Muslims how to survive and thrive in this uh, community here in the U.S. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Anam, I'm in 11th grade, and I grew up with Adam's World, and what it taught me was unity, respect, and love for the Muslim Ummah. Is Adam's World is the greatest show ever made. Take me to the Kaaba, man. I love that puppet. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid talking with Timaj Jarad and Taslim Jamila. Uh, Timaj, uh, tell me, you know, I ask a question to Taslim uh, about how Islam inspires or contributes uh, to your art form. So this is just going to be mostly me echoing <laughs> what Taslim just said so beautifully. Um, but Islam is really at the epicenter of everything. It informs everything. You know, I don't sometimes if someone once asked me, you know, why don't you make more devotional work? Why don't you make uh, something along the lines of, I guess, Nasheed and that kind of thing? And then I was thinking, you know, every single work that I make is, in my opinion, devotional, because at the end of the day, I'm hoping that it's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm hoping that, like Taslim said, it's I'm, I'm able to be a vessel and channel, you know, that light and energy in my work and that purpose. Um, the purpose at the end of the day is to return to God. And, you know, I have a lot of pieces that, that speak somewhat explicitly to that, not, not as a Muslim, but just as someone who is reaching for God. Um, and I think that, you know, even if I'm writing a piece about healing, if I'm writing a piece about whatever else, like it's always, that's always the, the focal point in terms of how my work is informed, even if I'm not explicitly saying that I'm Muslim or using Muslim terminology or anything like that. I haven't, uh, aside from my one piece, my single, because I'm also a singer songwriter, um, my single Black Gold, which is about being a Black Muslim, that's really my only piece that I've done explicitly about my identity. But all my other work has really been about whether it's about love or whether it's about community, whether it's a story that happened in my personal life, there's no way that I can that I can untether myself from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from, you know, being a Muslim, from Islam, because it is not just a part of what I do, it's the whole it's the whole of what I do. It's uh, really at the center. It's the nucleus of the work and the message and the purpose of, of what I hope to put out into this world. Hmm. MashaAllah. <clears throat> so uh, tell, tell me this, Taslim, that um, which black artist do you admire the most uh, when it comes to fighting and confronting racism and inequity in the society? Wow, that's a weighty question. I don't know if it's just one uh, black artist. I'll mention more. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, you, do you mean if you mean currently? Um, Current, currently. 
Okay, currently artists who are stepping out. <sighs> Let's think about that. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think currently because I have a lot of people that I've loved over the years as mentors and have mentors have for me have been that I loved consistently have been the last poets. And I had a chance to work with Abia Dune of the last poets on my first album. And also Umar bin Hussan, who is Muslim, he's a, a family friend of mine and a mentor. And so to me, the consistency with them speaking out um, to the injustices, and they've influenced so many people that are new school today to who are, because they are we coined them the fathers of hip hop. So before they were the hip hop, they, there was the spoken word. And also I love um, people like even consistent, when you talk about artists and hip hop, consistent people like Public Enemy. You have um, Chuck D and Professor Griff, who another people, personal people. I got to work with Professor Griff on my last album, which was released a few months ago. And so those are people to me who have been consistent, who are to me mentors and role models to newer artists today like me who are looking at them as being like political revolutionary. I also like Lauren Hill. You talk about, you know, female examples of women who always use their art as healing and, and an example and always to speaking out against injustices with outside and inside of yourself. So those are just a few to me that have been legendary in that time. And if we want to even go back further, um, to someone like um, more of the eclectic jazz. Is, I, I have Sun Ra, which I loved him. He talked about Black people being space is the place, you know, just taking us to a whole nother cosmic level that you have many of your Afrofuturistic jazz movement right now, which I am influenced by. And one of my teachers from Chicago, who was also Muslim, who was friends with Malcolm X, he passed away a few years ago, Baba Kalan Phil Karan, who worked with him to really teach me about um, music from a scientific and a cosmological level. Mm. You know, Jazz Festival in New Orleans, its executive director is an imam in New Orleans Mosque. Oh, wonderful. So, Imaj, what has been your, uh, you know, uh, who, who do you think uh, are good in terms of uh, fighting racism in Canada among the Black artists? Well, again, <laughs> heavy question. Um, in terms of my, you know, a lot of the times when I think of artists that inspire me, again, I kind of go back to the local the local art scene here, um, because those are the artists that I've had the most like one-on-one -on -one experiences with, that I've had the pleasure of, you know, attending many live performances and having conversations and really understanding the intention um, behind their work. And there are a lot of people um, that that don't necessarily get that shine that of, you know, necessarily like international acclaim or anything like that. But, you know, some folks that come to mind are um, like Rania Mujama, who is uh, also an anti-racism -race worker. She, she works in that field, but she's also a phenomenal poet. Um, and a lot of American poets are coming to mind right now too. So I'll just share a few that have inspired me growing up um, and artists in general, you know, folks like, like Nina Simone, um, I would say like an early Lupe Fiasco, uh, someone like Tark Tori, who is a poet, um, kind of on the come up at, at this moment. Um, and, you know, I'm really just inspired by the fact that knowing that people are not are not perfect and we need to also understand like when we're looking to people to inspire us that you know it's okay to to look at the part of the journey that um is inspiring and that resonates with us and that like so mm -hmm. because, yeah. because that's not the nature of humanity um but yeah those are a few names really love robert glasper as well um, so those are a few names that come to mind. So, Tim, I read uh, an article at Rolling Stones, and it says that the music industry was built on racism. Yeah. I didn't know that. Uh, you know, racism is all over the society, so in uh, industry it's understandable. But could you elaborate more, not only for myself, but also for our uh, listeners? Uh, do you agree with that statement 
that music industry was built on racism because uh, what will be American music scene without jazz and who plays jazz? Yes, well, in, in America, uh, unfortunately, most things were built on racism. And yes, the music industry, it was mainly built, of course, around Black artists, but it was built on them not having control over their masters, signing contracts that literally signed their um, rights away for their music to be passed down from generations to generations when artists just didn't have the knowledge or they didn't have the resources like we have now to create and be independent for ourselves. So you do have many artists who are on record labels, especially even in Chicago, many blues artists that died poor, that really died because, and the people that own the rights to who were, you know, white owners of record labels who are still reaping the benefits from their family with their royalties that are being passed down. And so you have that and you still have that that goes on. And now today you still have some artists that may sign some contracts that may sign everything away, but people are really being educated more to be independent and to own their rights. And you see even people like Prince was leading the way when he was tied into a contract when he had slave on his face at um, award ceremony saying, I will not be a slave to the industry. He originally, just like Michael Jackson, got his rights back to his music. But, you know, after their death, a whole nother story. But it's a very serious business because of art and music. It's uh, billions and billions of dollars. And so you have artists, like you said before, when it was founded on that to exploit them and to really use them and give them pennies when they didn't know any better. So yes, it was founded on that. And I, I thank God that now you have so many examples of independent artists who are breaking out of that, who are not just looking for a record contract or someone else to sign on to say, I can do this myself independently. We have direct contact with the public, with people who uh, admire our work and supporters on social media and so many mediums now that you don't even have to go that route. You can directly get the money yourself. We have many distributors, um, throughout the world where our art, you can put something out. I can make something in my studio. I have a home studio. I can make something and put it out the next day myself with all the copywriting, with all the, the legal um, protection. They have the different um, different uh, companies and corporations that you can educate yourself to do that. So, But yes, it was created on the racism. And if you read really the history of it, you see a lot of artists that will tell you that we admire that they did not make a lot of money and some still don't own like Tribe Called Quest. They still don't own the rights to their masters. Hmm. So, so tell me, Timaj, uh, what is the state of networking among Muslim artists? Uh, are they, you know, not just African Muslim, but Muslim artists, is there a good, better networking? Are there lists of, are they WhatsApp groups? How, how do they communicate among themselves to support each other? So that's definitely a gap, I believe, in our community is that, you know, um, sometimes artists are just working in silos in, in our community and various different communities. But I think especially the Muslim community, there are a lot of challenges um, with being a Muslim artist, particularly being a woman, um, because, you know, there's that whole like uh, tug of war over like theology. Like there's first of all, we have to get over the barrier of should you even be an artist? Because that's a challenge for some Muslims being able to see a visible Muslim um, on their screen singing a song or on stage, you know, uh, performing a poem. Um, there has been some 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 barriers or backlashes that it, that even I've experienced. And so I think that a lot of like Muslim events and festivals and things like that, you know, there has been there has been an effort um, to bring people together, but unfortunately, I don't see that there is really a, a, a deep engagement in terms of Muslims collaborating, Muslim artists collaborating with each other and things like that. I think there's a little bit of a, uh, you know, a competitive air um, when you're in a competitive industry, right, like music or poetry. Um, and part of my work, actually, my community engaged arts work is to 
to somewhat dissolve all of that and to show people that actually we're living in abundance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that, you know, this is a place of abundance for us, but there, the fear of scarcity is what keeps us away from each other. And so building those connections based on the understanding that actually when you are winning, I'm also winning um, is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, not only as an artist, but just as someone as part of, part of this community, seeing people struggling and going at it alone, the lack of mentorship, mm -hmm. the lack of encouragement from our community community as a whole, um, but also uh, from from our familial units, you know, that grow up uh, with this understanding of like, well, here are the pathways and none of them include the arts, like doctor, lawyer, engineer, accountant, whatever, right? Um, and that's further reinforced by a society and a community that doesn't necessarily give artists the respect, to be honest with you. I can't tell you how many times I've had you know, Muslim organizations ask me to perform for free or, you know, I get to the venue and I'm not treated well. Um, and, and this is something, and again, I've, I've, I'm someone who's had a lot of amazing, I've worked with a lot of amazing Muslim organizers and I've, I've been fortunate enough to have those great opportunities as well. So this is not a slight to those that, that make the space and are trying, but there is still a gap and there's still this understanding. There's, there's still not an understanding of the value of the arts. People want artists at their events, at their conferences and their spaces, but they don't necessarily want to uh, pay us or they don't necessarily see it as work. And I think that, um, you know, it's sad that that a, a non-Muslim arts organization or space or promoter venue, what, what have you, is more readily willing to pay me than a, my own community. That like that makes me very sad. So I think that there needs to be a really serious effort to, um, you know, just educate our community in terms of the value of the arts um, and also really the understanding that you know the art there's nothing wrong with the arts there's nothing islamically wrong with the arts we actually have a very rich tradition as muslims in the arts you know the like muslims have been extremely pivotal in advancing the arts like so so much poetry coming out of of our tradition so much music so really just understanding that the arts is very important in in our tradition and should be important in our future as well Taslim, as we're coming close to it, what about uh, uh, performing a little bit? Okay. Each one of you, just uh, we got five minutes, so take okay. away two, three minutes each. Okay, so um, I'll do a poem. Okay. And um, this is just called She's Passionate. And this is from my, I. I released the album. It's on all streaming platforms. And so it has music to it, produced by Professor Griff of Public Enemy. And I'm going to do a medley. Okay. Bismillah. They say she's so passionate, so perfectly present with divine purpose, powerfully packed and potent, persistent on a mission that's masterfully mastered, a masterpiece, a mixture of spiritual power, lyrical showers, and lyrical sash. And now, that's some passion. She be trashing the tragic torment that tattered torn souls from psychological war torn holes. I'm the daughter of Mansa Musa, mine like friends for none, phenomenal like Zorno Hurston and them. I study ancient texts like Al Ghazali, antique artifacts skilled in the lyrical art of facts. No PhD yet, but I'm so, so scholarly. That's why sisters holler at me because they hear me. The angels dwell near me and steer me with knowledge that's so polished that they acknowledge me like I'm college, except I demolish all the lies. I'm so solid and gifted with the scrolls and scripts that's lifted from the ether realm while I take trips so I don't trip on the stagnant stain of planet chips from slave ships. I'm here to free you so you'll see you. See, I come from those Southern farmers and Baptist preachers, shy town imams and mystical teachers, psychic mamas, village healers, Sunday pew kneelers, dream catchers when everyone else tried to steal us, those warrior women who fight with spirit and gun, those men whose bravery is unparalleled, brighter than the sun, whose grandmama's cooking is conjuring, bringing heaven from hell, those who get royalty in their cells. I come from those who fly with angels and see life at every angle. I come from women who put rose quartz under pillows, who convene in sacred circles so generations can still grow. 
I come from Mississippi and Alabama, Dr. Watts Hillers, those who resurrect everybody, their mama and the Dillas, who sang freedom songs, who are God-like strong, who transform front porches to become community congregations. Kitchens are sacred sanctuary, feeding souls and bellies with jarred jellies, herbal elixirs and fixers to fix her after she's broken, hearts and abortion distortions and reclaiming the queens to royal rituals, transformative tinctures with plants and soup bones, water bowls and crystal stones, beat pentatonic tones, moaning music with prayer circles and hand claps that made possibilities plentiful with mind crafts and spirit imaginations, water wombs and shucking corn, healing okra soup, self-governing elder sessions to listen to prophecy, root connection. We are earth people anchored me in power and allowed me to fly free. So I hold freedom in their eyes and hands. Beauty boomers, the ancestors are calling us to grandma's bosoms in the backyards, baking. They creating love beyond this realm. And I feel a piece of peace to Sankofa in order to spring forth. And we hold on till they pray us whole. They are whole. They pray us whole. Please pray us whole. Wow. That was amazing. Wow, I'm the daughter of Mansa Musa. You got me there, sister. <laughs> wow. So, Timaj, you want to share something? Sure, I'll, I'll share a piece. It's called Black Gold, and it's actually a, a poem that I, I turned into a song um, by the same name. And it's that one poem that I was talking about that's based on identity, my identity as a Black Muslim woman. Black Muslim girls. Black Muslim girls, Black Muslim girls, you are more than magic. You are a multitude of dope fly out of this world, love making love to love, melanated masterpiece. There is nothing tragic about you. The tragedy is living in a world that brings you the kind of grief that has you digging the earth with your teeth, duality wrapped in your tongue as you code switch deep enough to be Black and Muslim, but rarely at the same time, your spine is a site of intergenerational trauma. And they mine your back until it cracks and exposes the black gold from your backbone that was sought, but this is not a minery. We are the kind of women with a softness that will sink you and lift you at the same time. Prayer bead woven fingers when we are triggered then proceed to whisper scriptures and strive higher than the brand of justice that was promised here, here. And the dance between the ephemeral and eternal, here in the in-between, here in the, you can't hear yourself loud enough to hear your dreams sometimes, here, here, here in the place where. A woman at the masjid once asked me where I'm from. So I say, I'm Ethiopian. And she says, wow, mashallah, just like Bilal, but then mixes it with dirty looks mixed with, that must be why you're doing it wrong. Do it like this mixed with, so what are you mixed with? Like it's a compliment. And I want to tell her I'm mixed with black and even blacker than that, unapologetically blacker than black, black Muslim girls, black Muslim girls, black Muslim girls. I know the world is burning with your names right now, but you are not a forest fire. You are not a forest fire. You are the brilliance of many suns and the wisdom of many moons. I know this system makes you nervous sometimes, but your nervous system was designed to feed you feeling impulses for your through your pulse for healing your winter's withering in your bloom while holding on to their truths your blackness has always been in season your blackness has always been in season your blackness has always been in season and that's from my song black gold which you can wow. check wow powerful show. powerful so much life thank you so much for your kindness to share this with me, with us. Uh, that was Timah Jarat, who is uh, who works with Toronto Art Council. And with us was Taslim Jamila uh, with My Soul Speaks. I mean, I could see your soul, both of your songs. I mean, maybe you want to join LLC there. <laughs> that is powerful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Sherdil Khan, for inviting two great guests and hosting this show. I mean, pro producing this show and Dr. Abdul Wahid. And thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And stay tuned for other programming because Muslim Network TV is there 24 7 on a Galaxy 19 satellite, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, Apple TV, and our website is muslimnetwork.tv. Peace. Salam. <laughs>